Just bow our heads as we pray. We thank you, Holy Father, for the fact, O oh Lord, that you have been with us throughout this day. We have had many ministries and, Lord, many lessons that we have learnt in this day. It has been a privilege that we come to the foot of your feet that we could learn. Lord, as we go into this last part of our camp meeting for this day, we pray that you will bless us. In Jesus' name, let the church say, Amen. A sermon about balance. And so I have chosen uh, my text in which to depart from. Turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 21. And this is the uh, John the Revelator in vision. And what he is observing is the holy city as it is coming down from heaven out of God. And so he begins to describe what he sees. And there in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 16, he says, The city is, the city, let me just go there now. The city is laid out as a square. And its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. Amen. I'd like to talk to you for the next few minutes, taking that single text, on the subject the three dimensions of a complete life. The three dimensions of a complete life. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Lord, one of our greatest challenges is balance. And yet your word gives us insight onto how to achieve and what that balance looks like. I pray, Heavenly Father, therefore, that you will illuminate our minds to receive your word, that we may look upon this text with different glasses and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, John the Revelator is imprisoned on a lonely island called Patmos. And he is deprived of every freedom except the freedom to think. And so I suspect he may have thought about the old political order with its tragic incompletenesses and horrible injustices. Uh, he may have thought about the old Jerusalem with its superficial holiness and its legalistic religion. But in the midst of his agonizing vision of the old, John also had a glorious vision of something new and something great. He saw the new and holy Jerusalem come from out of heaven from God. And the noblest thing about this new heavenly city was its completeness. Uh, radiant as daybreak, ending a long night of stagnating incompleteness. It was not partial or one-sided, but it was complete in all three of its dimensions. And so in describing the city, John says the length, the breadth, and the height uh, were equal. Uh, this new city of God, my friends, was not to be some unbalanced entity with towering virtues on one side and degrading devices on the other. It was complete in all three of its dimensions. Uh, for many people, the book of Revelation is a strange book and puzzling to decode. And as a result, many people have cast it aside as an enigma that is wrapped up in mystery. 
but beneath uh, John's peculiar jargon and prevailing apocalyptic symbolism, we find many challenging and profound truths. And one such truth is set forth in our text this evening, my friends, because I believe that when John was describing the new city of God, he was in substance describing ideal humanity. He was saying in substance that life is at its best when it is complete in all three of its dimensions. Somebody say amen out here. If that in substance was what John was trying to say, then in our own individual and collective lives, there is a disturbing incompleteness. There is an agonizing partialness. Very seldom are we able to affirm greatness in an unqualified sense. Almost following every affirmation of greatness is a conjunction, but. Uh, allow me to unpack that for you for a moment. The Bible, you see, suggests a disturbing incompleteness. The Bible declares that Naaman was a great man, but. That but, my friends, reveals something tragic and something disturbing. He was a leper despite his greatness. Are you with me, my friends? Uh, Hannah was most beloved of her husband, Elkanah. She was the first and most loved, but, 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 that but comes again, my friends. You see, that but reveals the painful reality that she could bear no children. Many sitting here today have reached some degree of success, uh, dreamed and longed for, but that but denotes the startling reminder that achievement and apparent success does not necessarily equate to happiness. When I studied history, Greece was considered a great nation which left for succeeding generations an inexhaustible treasury of knowledge from the philosophical insights of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Because of these great minds, we are told, we are now an heir to the legacy of creative ideas. Greece was a great nation, but... That but, my friends, underscores the fact that Greece was an aristocracy for some of the people and not a democracy for all of the people. That but, my friends, stands for the ugly fact that the Greek city-states were built upon the foundations of slavery. When I was forced to study Western civilization because in England they didn't give us any African history so I had no choice but to study European history. Can you pray for the preacher? <laughs> but when I had no choice but to study Western civilization. I was told that Western civilization was a great civilization, giving the world the magnificence of the insights of the Renaissance, the glad thunders and the majestic melodic signs of Handel, the majestic sweet notes of Beethoven, and the charming melodies of Bach. That's what, that's what I was told. The industrial revolution and man's commencement to his marvelous trek towards the city of material abundance. Western civilization is said to be great, but that but, my friends, reveals to us the injustices and the evils of slavery and colonialism. And of a civilization that has permitted its material means to outdistance its spiritual end. So almost every affirmation of greatness is followed not by a full stop symbolizing greatness and completeness, but rather by a comma uh, punctuating its nagging incompleteness. Many of the greatest civilizations are great only in certain aspects. Many of our greatest men are great only in certain ways and are low and degrading in other regards. Yet, the Bible suggests, my friends, that life 
if it is to be full and complete on every side, in fact, my friends, those who enter the holy gates of the city is a reflection in their own lives of the completeness of the city. Somebody say amen. So, 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 life has three dimensions suggested in our text. Being length, breadth, and height. I would like to suggest to you tonight, my friends, that the length of life is one's inward concern to drive one's own personal ends and ambitions. It is a healthy inward concern for one's own welfare and achievements. The breadth of life, on the other hand, is the outward concern for others. And finally, the height of life is the upward reach for God. Somebody say amen out here. Let us first turn to the length of life or the individual's concern about developing his or her inner gifts and talents. There is, in this sense, such thing as rational, healthy self-interest. The late Rabbi Joshua Lieberman in his book pointed out in an interesting chapter of his book, Peace of Mind, he said, we must love ourselves properly before we can adequately love others. Many people are plunged into the abyss of emotional fatalism because they do not love themselves in a wholesome way, therefore it's hard for them to love their neighbor as themselves. Help me somebody. <laughs> you see, every person must have a concern for self and feel a responsibility to discover his or her own purpose and mission in life. Miles Monroe, but forgive me for quoting him, but I think he made a good statement when he said, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without a purpose. It is dangerous to be alive and not know why you have been given life. Like a rider on a rocking horse, it is possible to produce much motion in your life, but very little progress. God has given every normal person a capacity to achieve some end. Yes, it is true that some are more endowed with talents than others, but God has not left any individual on this planet talentless. Potential gifts of creativity are within us and we have a duty to work and to discover these gifts. And after we have discovered what we have been made for and what we have been called for, we should surrender all of the powers of our being to the achievement of this. We should seek to do whatever God has called us to do so well that the living, the dead or the unborn couldn't do it better than ourselves. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said, did you? Whatever God has called you to do, you must do it so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn could not do it better than yourself. You should seek to do it, my friends, as though God Almighty himself called you at that particular moment in time and at that moment in history to fulfill that purpose. Abilities are like tax deductions. Either you use it or you lose it. No one ever makes a great contribution to humanity without this majestic sense of purpose and dogged determination. Ellen White says in Christ's Object Lesson, page 209, that thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object to which to live to, nor standard in which to reach. No one ever brings their potential into actuality without this powerful inner drive. That's why Booker T. Washington himself said that success is not to be measured so much by the position that one has reached in life, but rather by the obstacles that one has had to overcome while trying to succeed. My friends, the reason I'm talking first and foremost about the length of life is that some of us do our jobs in a lazy way. 
We go to work and can't wait to get out the moment we step in. We watch for the clock to reach four and we are gone with half the work done. And that procrastinative behavior will never put you in good stead for God to give you more until you learn what little you have to do, you do it well. I have discovered, my friends, that when I was washing dishes for 16 hours a day, trying to move on the economic ladder, I washed those dishes so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn could not wash dishes like me. When my mother-in-law, when I used to work in the church, my friends, and we would have a little place in which we would clean, my mother-in-law told me, son, when you clean those floors of the church, you clean it so well that you can see your face in it. Because when the saints come, you want to know that God is following them as well. So you make sure that when you clean those toilets and when you clean those sinks, do it so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it better than yourself. You can't expect God to to give you more if you can't even deal with the little things properly to the young people I say this regarding the length of life many of you many of you are either in high school university or are currently working and we are challenged on every hand to work untiringly to achieve excellence in our life work not all of us are necessarily called to professional or specialized jobs. Maybe even fewer will rise to the heights of the genius. But I want you to understand something, my young friends. No work is insignificant. All labor that un uplifts humanity has dignity and importance. And therefore should be undertaken with a painstaking excellence. Booker T. Washington said, no race can prosper until it learns there is as much dignity in tilling a soil as writing a book. Martin Luther King once said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep those streets like Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep those streets so well that all the hosts of heaven of earth would have to pause and say, here lived a good street sweeper who did his job well. Doc Douglas Maddock himself said, if you can't be a pine on the top of a hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub by the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree, and if you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, then be a star. It isn't by size that you win or fall, but be the best that God has called you to be. Set yourself earnestly to discover what you are called to do, and and then give yourself passionately to doing it. This clear onward drive towards self-fulfillment, I would like to suggest, is the length of life. But, alas, some people never get beyond the first dimension of life. They may be brilliant people who have superbly developed their inner powers, but they are shackled by the chains of a paralyzing self-centeredness. They live within the narrow confines of their own personal ambitions and desires and the very title they have acquired at university, be it BA or MBA or PhD or CEO or MD or GM, has now, has now created a monster of selfishness. What is more tragic? than to find an individual who is bogged down with the length of life and devoid of the breadth of life. If life is to be complete, my brothers and sisters, it must include not only the dimension of length, but also the dimension of breadth, which is the individual concerns with, he concerns himself with the welfare of others. No man can learn to live until he can rise above his own narrow confines of his own individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. 
No man has learned to live until he has lived beyond his own mere existence and has begun to live in the footsteps of others. No man has learned to live until he has learned in the words of the Apostle Paul to die daily to self in order that he may live for Christ. Length without breath is like a self-contained stream having no outward flow to the ocean, stagnant, still, and stale. It lacks both life and freshness. In order for life, my friends, to be lived meaningfully, our concern must be wedded with the concerns of others. This is the breadth of life. Jesus draws our attention uh, to this subject matter uh, by utilizing a story known as the narrow road, known to many in his day as the bloody road. It was known as the bloody road because it was very conducive to robbery. Due to its narrow and winding curves dropping 3,400 feet in just under 17 miles descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. Mark chapter 10 and verse 30 highlights the story and we know it as the Jericho road. This poor traveler had been accosted and spoiled and mutilated and left half dead with his life edging, edging, ebbing away. The Bible says that he was passed by on the one side by a priest and coldly observed and abandoned by a Levite. And when it seemed that death was to be his companion and Sheol was meant to be his grave, then when hope became a distant dream and the will to live became a fading reality, then came a Samaritan who poured the oil of mercy upon his wounds. Now the question we must ask ourselves in this particular story is this. Uh, why did the priest and the Levi leave the man to die on the road. There have been many speculations. It has been often said that maybe the priest was on his way to perform his priestly rituals and by law he could not touch anyone. Maybe the Levi was possibly rushing to a Jericho Road Improvement Association meeting and maybe felt that it was better to deal with the causal problems of the road rather than dealing with the consequences of the road. <laughs> but I would like to suggest another reason, my friends, and, 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 and it is highlighted more when, when I was in my early days doing crusades in Soweto and Soweto was not the safest place to be and you're typically taught that you never stop at a red light at night and I remember I'd finished this crusade and I'd, I'd been preaching my heart out and, and now I was on my way home and, and as I was on my way home going through Soweto I was hitting a red light but I saw a man there trying to flag me down, flag me down. He seemed to be in distress but I looked at him, looked at the red light, thought about Soweto, looked at him and I kept on driving. <laughs> you want to know why I kept on driving? Fear. Fear. The core question I believe on the mind of the Samaritan when he stepped off his mule was not what will happen to my personal well-being if I help this man but rather what will happen to this man if I don't help him. I believe as he walked to the bruised and bleeding man on that bloody road, the question on his mind was not how quickly he could help, get help so he could go on his way, but rather what can I do, what resources do I have to make this man well? I believe, my friends, that we need to get to the point as a church where we can say what will happen to our youth if we don't help them. What will happen to this church if I don't put my hands 
to the plow? What will happen to this nation of Kenya if we don't seek to redress the balances by reflecting oneness in Christ while everybody else is going crazy? At least they have a model to work on which is God's true church where there is no tribe, no nation, no race, but we are one in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen out here. Jesus painted the picture of the judgment day in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 32 he said when the son of man comes in his glory with all of his angels he will sit on his royal throne then the nations will be brought towards him and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from their goats Jesus made it clear, my brothers and sisters, that the norm for determining the division between the sheep and the goats would be the deeds done to others. You see, on that day, God will not be asking you how many academic degrees you obtained or whether you attended the University of Cape Town, Vitz, Rao, or Kenya University. On that day, he will not ask you how much money you have accumulated in your bank account, or whether you made it to GM, MD, or CEO. He will not be asking you, my friends, whether you were able to free yourself from historical poverty, or whether you are now able to move to the upper echelons of the leafy suburbs, or whether you've transcended from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive, drive but he's gonna ask you the question what did you do for others did you feed the hungry did you visit the sick did you clothe the naked these are the questions that will be asked by the Lord of life and why will he ask this because one of the greatest tragedies of our times is that in our rise to greatness many of us have forgotten from whence we came from we have forgotten the unexpected help that we received the, when the funds were low and the debts were high. We have forgotten the God of our childhood years who would cause somebody to provide a way out of nowhere when there was no bread on the table. And so God is asking the question, as I have done unto you, what are you doing for others? In a sense, my friends, every day is judgment day. As through our deeds, our words, our silence and speech, we are constantly writing in the book of life. Light has come into the world, and every man must decide whether he is to walk in the light of creative altruism or darkness and destructive selfishness. I've already shared with you, my friends, sometimes my frustration with the consumer church, where so few are prepared to put their hands to the plow, but yet so many will watch others burn out who put their hands to the plow. In the final analysis, my friends, all men are interdependent and we are inevitably our brother's keeper and no nation and no individual can live in isolation. This is the breadth of life. But there is one more dimension of the complete life that remains, namely the height or that upward reach towards something infinitely greater than oneself we must rise my friends above earth and give our ultimate allegiance to that eternal being who is the source and the ground of our reality and when we add height to length and breadth only then do we have a complete life my friends just in case you don't know who the height of life is, let me tell you who the height of life is. In Genesis, you see, they called him Shiloh. 
And in Exodus, they called him the great I am. Numbers called him the star and scepter. And Deuteronomy, praise God, called him the rock of all ages. Joshua declared him to be the captain of the Lord's host. And Job said, his name is Redeemer. Can I get a witness out here? A psalm said in David, he is the Lord and shepherd. And Solomon called him the beloved. Isaiah called him the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Uh, Daniel called him the fourth man and Micah said his going forth is from everlasting to everlasting. Bless your heart Haggai because you know he is the desire of all nations. Zechariah called him the branch and Mas Malachi called him the messenger of the covenant. Matthew called him savior and Mark called him the son of man. Luke called him the vague physician and John called him the word made flesh. Somebody say amen out here. The book of Acts declares that he is the name above all all other names and Thessalonians declares the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ will write first Hebrews says he is our great high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our informities but was in all points tempted as we are Jews said he is able to keep me from falling and present me faultless before the throne and John said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day because because he is Alpha, he is Omega, he is the beginning, he is the end. Just in case you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. That's who I'm talking about. He is the height of life. But just as there are some people who never get beyond length, there are others who never get beyond the combination of length and breadth. They brilliantly develop their gifts and talents. They have a genuine humanitarian concern, but they stop short right there. There are several reasons why modern man has probably neglected this third dimension. Uh, some men have honest intellectual doubts looking upon the horrors of, 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 of moral and natural evil and they ask if God is so all powerful then why does he permit such unmerited pain and suffering to exist and so their in inability to answer these questions leads them to agnosticism and at best atheism Others cannot conceptualize God without rational scientific evidence and therefore they become atheists. But I suspect, my friends, there are a majority of people that fit into another category. They are not theoretical atheists. They are practical atheists. They do not deny God with their lips but they are continually denying the existence of God with their lives and they live as if there is no God even though they come to church every day to praise God. They are atheists who compromise the truth for the sake of peace. Atheists who fail to keep their zips up and their skirts down. Atheists who spend more time tearing down than lifting up. Atheists who claim to preach a transforming gospel but have failed to allow the gospel to transform them. Like Ephesus, you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. But nevertheless, the Lord says, I have this against you. You have the length of life, the breadth of life, but you have lost your first love, the height of life. My friends, I want to urge you as I come to the close of my message to give your priority to God. Allow his spirit to permeate your being before the ship of your harbor, ship of your life reaches its last harbor. There will be long and drawn out storms and howling winds and tempestuous seas that would make your heart stand still. And if you don't have a deep and patient faith in God, you will be powerless to face the delays and the disappointments and the problems that will inevitably come without God, my friends.
All our efforts turn to ashes and our sunrises to darkest nights. Without God in our lives, life is a meaningless drama to which the decisive scenes are missing. By with him, my friends, but with him, we are able to rise from those tension-packed valleys of our lives and rise to the sublime heights of inner peace and the radiant stars of hope against the nocturnal bosom of life's most depressing nights. I share with you a story as I close. A wise old preacher went to a college to deliver a baccalaureate sermon. After finishing his message, he lingered on the campus to talk to the members of the graduating class. And he spoke to a brilliant young graduate by the name of Robert. His first question to Robert was, Robert, what are your plans for your future? I plan immediately to go law school, said Robert. What then, Robert? I plan to get married, start a family, and then get myself securely established in a law practice. What then, Robert? I must frankly say that I plan to make lots of money from my law practice and retire early and spend my time traveling and seeing the world. Something I've always wanted to do. What then, Robert? Added the preacher with an almost annoying inquisitiveness. Well, said Robert, these are all my plans. Looking at Robert with a countenance of pity and fatherly concern, the preacher said, Young man, your plans are far too small. They only extend 75, at best 100 years. You must make your plans big enough to include God and large enough to include eternity. This is wise advice. And I suspect all too many of us are still dabbling in plans that are big in quantity but small in quality. Plans that move you on the horizontal plane of time rather than the vertical plane of eternity. But I would urge you, Karangata Church, to make your plans so large and so broad that they cannot be bound by the chains of time and space. Give your life all that you have and are to God, the God of the universe whose purpose changes not. And where do we find God? Where well, we don't find him in a test tube, but we find him in Jesus Christ, the Lord of our lives. By knowing him, we know God. God is not only God-like, but God is Christ-like. Jesus is the word made flesh. He is the language, my friends, of eternity, translated in words of time. And if we are to know what God is like and to understand his purposes for mankind, we must turn to Jesus Christ. And by committing ourselves absolutely to Christ and his way, we participate in the marvelous act of faith that will bring a true knowledge of God. So what is the conclusion of the whole matter? Love yourself. You're commanded to do that. That is the length of life. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're commanded to do that. That is the breadth of life. But there is one first and even greater commandment and that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And when you search in an upward reach for God, when you get all these three things together, length, breadth, and height, righteousness and justice will tumble down like a mighty stream, and no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. 
When you get all these three things together, my friends, you will be able to mount on wings of eagles and you will run and never get weary. Somebody say amen. When, when you get all these three things together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you'll have a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead you. When you get all these three things together, then you will hear the Lord of life say to you on that last day, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty and you gave me drink I was lonely and you were afraid in prison and you remembered me and visited me and you will say to the Lord when did I see you a stranger and you took me in or naked and clothed me or sick and in prison and the Lord will say when you did it to one of the least of these my brethren you did it unto me. This, my friends, is the length, breadth, and height of life. The holy city. Those who enter it are a reflection of its perfection. May God bless you all. Amen. Father God, you don't want good, you want great. You don't call us to be the tail, you call us to be the head. You have called us, O oh Lord, to have the length of life, the breadth of life, and the height of life. But without the height of life, the breadth and the length are useless. May we seek to evaluate our lives, O oh Lord, and begin to understand your expectations for our lives. You have given us very clear guidelines that the holy city reflects the perfection of the saints who are to enter into it. But we recognize, O oh Lord, it is not by our works, but your righteousness that covers us, that all allows us to enter into that holy city. But what we find in our hands to do, you expect us to do it with all our might and our strength. And so bless us, O oh Lord, at this end of the day, at this camp meeting. We have been blessed on many fronts. And as we go home, O oh Lord, to reflect and ponder upon that which we have learned within this day, May it be, O oh Lord, that our hearts were refreshed. Grant us a peaceful night's rest and be it your will that we may come again tomorrow as we enter into your Sabbath rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.